Excellent. Welcome to this version of the Spring Summit, the newest one. It's, um, it's almost starting to be a routine to say this is the largest ever, and it's amazing to see how, um, how many people we have here. And it's true. This is actually pretty mind-boggling. Um, so being a data science company that we are, doing software for data science, we obviously started analyzing this a little bit and started to create predictions and trying to figure out um, how many people will actually show up in the end. So Iris bought a sophisticated nine workflow using tons of AI and machine learning. In the end, I think it's just regression, but anyway, we'll call it AI. Um, and already on January 15th, when we had 103 registrations, we, her workflow predicted 379 registrations. So we looked at that, it looked very interesting. Almost two months later, March 7th, we had 333 registrations, and we ended up with a prediction of 377. So of course, now you want to do the reality check. You look at the reality check, and you look at the number of attendees, 378. When we saw that, that's the moment when Iris started thinking about resigning and starting her own business, going into event participation predictions. Of course, there's the nasty thing about that one. The goal of the analysis was not to predict how many people were in the room today, but how many registrations are we going to have the week before. That's the 378. Reality is we have 409 non-nine people in the room today. So we cracked the 400. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. So that's one, one lesson worth remembering. What's the analysis goal? What are you actually trying to predict? Is, is that really what you need to do? Um, and then obviously, the truth behind of all of this data science, whoever here is doing data science, everybody I assume, knows that it's usually not as nice as this one. And it isn't. So if you look at what happened over the course of time, you actually see that somewhere in here, in February, we were close to predicting 600 people. So somehow our regression model went all over the place, and the reason for that is very, very simple. We were using the wrong data, right? Once you start looking into your data science process, you start realizing, you know, just looking at past numbers and how your current numbers are going up and totally ignoring what's going out, what's going on out there in social media and other things. And somewhere in early February, we actually released the first draft of the agenda and started mass mailing to everybody here in the room and a couple more people, telling them about the agenda being online, which of course triggered lots more registrations, which totally threw off that poor little model. So, so much for Iris Business, she's so still with nine, and you can see her on, on stage later today. What do I really want to do today? I figured I'll do a little bit of a diagnostic um, look at NIME. We'll do a bit of prediction and we'll also do a little bit of descriptive, maybe even prescriptive types of analysis. I wanted to talk very briefly about the last year, what it brought to us, a couple talk about a couple highlights, one more recent 2019 highlight. Um, I wanted to talk a bit, spend a bit of time talking about trends, the types of trends that we see in the industry, what's going on, and also maybe talk a bit about what we can do about that, a little bit of a tad descriptive in there as well. And then maybe just do a little bit of what's going on right now. We'll talk about the Spring Summit as those of you, about half of you are repeat visitors, the other half are newbies to the, the NIME Summit, welcome. Um, as the, the half that has been here before noticed probably that we changed things around a little bit and I wanted to motivate a little bit why we're doing that. And obviously this is work in progress, so if you have feedback at the end of the summit, stuff that worked, also stuff that didn't work, do let us know. Um, a couple of recent highlights. Um, one of the things, obviously, to me is always people joining NIME, the new NIMERS. There's a long list of people. You may remember last year we already introduced Christiane, even though she wasn't quite fully on board. She joined, I think, a month later, but she already attended the training, so to the summit. She's now in charge of the summit. So everything that goes smoothly and well is the team's effort, and everything that didn't go well, just talk to Christiane and complain with her about it. Um, as you see, the, I mean, in the past, we focused a lot more on technology, hiring developers. This is, has changed a bit over the years. We have uh, still a couple of developing people on there. Obviously, there's Mark Books joined us in the Berlin office. But a lot of those people with a little icon are people that actually have social skills, unlike me and some of the other developers, and can talk to people. They can talk to users. They can talk to customers, provide support these types of things. So Cynthia is in that realm. Stefan is actually in charge of the academic relations. And the ones with the artistical icons are actually people that know how to code, but they also have taste, which is also a rare 
kind of mix to find, so they are very much in charge of the new UX and the front ends of NIME and some of the things that Christian is going to show later. You'll notice it looks unfamiliarly pleasant to the eye, I guess, and that's probably mostly they're doing. Um, maybe also worth pointing out that at the size that we are right now, we are more than 80 people in the organization, which was kind of funny this morning looking during the briefing just at the people working for NIME. That's a larger crowd than we had at some of our UGMs or summits. Um, so we now have people that are helping us just to keep the organization running. Lioba is not here, unfortunately. She's based in Constance doing our bookkeeping. And a very new addition to the team is Tanja Tibach, our new CFO. So if we become more picky about you paying your bills on time, if you're a customer, that's your fault. Um, what else worth highlighting? Maybe Cassiana, who is in charge of all the videos. So if you see sophisticated video cutting stuff, that's really all her doing. One other interesting aspect here is that quite a number of those people are actually based in the US. So we now have a, an Austin office. Jim, how many are we? Nine or ten? I lose count from time to time. I think we're almost we're, we're close to a dozen people in the Austin office and one outlier based in New York. That's Paul Treichler in charge of our partner program. You're going to see him later on stage as well. So we have spent quite a bit of effort in growing the US team. A couple other highlights. Obviously, there's lots of new technology. I used to cover that during my opening a little bit as well, but that doesn't quite work anymore. So there's so much cool stuff to talk about. So we do have three dedicated sessions to that one. That's already a little change to the previous summit where we had just one chunk of what's new at the beginning of the summit. We now are spreading that out over the, over the two days. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about what's new for in terms of deployment options, what kind of technology have we done there. Um, then on Thursday morning, there's a what's new in analytics platform, and in the afternoon, we'll talk a little bit more of ser about server, and we hope that gets it, makes it a bit easier to sort of digest all of the new stuff that's been going on at night. Um, we have tons of new users. Um, we try to still very much stay away from releasing download numbers because it's extremely hard to find a good, solid metric for usage. I mean, downloads, we have millions of downloads, of course, but that doesn't mean nothing, right? I mean. People download it, stop using it almost immediately. You want to measure people who regularly use stuff. But we see a lot of growth, so we're try, trying to look at different indicators that help us measure that a bit more objectively. One thing is, of course, we have 24 talks at this summit alone of people talking about how they use NIME, the open source platform, or NIME server. That's a great asset already. We had, to, had so many talk proposals, we started to do parallel checks. Um, Greg has, a, has an I highlight of, of his own. Those of you familiar with web technology may have noticed that we actually switched from an old vintage system to something that's 21st century and will, you can expect more changes also to the front pages to come fairly soon. And then to me, office expansion is worth noticing. Maybe in, in Constance we doubled the office space. In Berlin, Tobias claims they're moving in April 1st. I'm not quite sure which year he's talking about. Sometime this year they will move into much larger space in, in Berlin, so if you ever are in town, Visit us, stop by for coffee. And Austin, Jim is currently there, kind of stuffed into three little offices in WeWork. We're desperately looking for more space. If you know someone in Austin who rents office space, do let us know. And then, of course, the community growth. How do you measure that? You can look at things like the forum. I've done that in the past summits as well, just looking at who is active on the forum. And you can see the orange ones are the nine people and all the others are non-NIMERs, so the long tail of people being active on the forum is definitely dominated by non-timers. Then some of our people, in particular Iris and Scott, trying to be smart by choosing a capital first letter in their in forum name so that it looks larger, but it actually isn't. So our, the, the top posters that we have, and it's worth, thank you very much, I mean, they're extremely active on the forum. They're almost posting on a daily basis, helping other users, Martin Lauer, Ivan, and Igor, um, I think all of them, only Ivan is here, the other two unfortunately couldn't make it. And then there's a few more, and I'm just showing them. Philip Katz is not here either. Armin Gurt is in top number five. And Steve, you, you must be here somewhere. You really need to start working again. I mean, you slipped out of the top five last year. So there's work to do. So this is cool. This already shows you there's a, a huge community. I mean, just look at the number of, of forum names here. And they're active in the forum, helping each other. It's very, very nice to see. Um, 
The other thing that you see is the blog that we started to do a lot more regularly last year. We have now bi-weekly uh, blog posts. A lot of those blog posts actually come from users, from customers, from community members contributing to that one. So thank you very much. And do talk to Heather or Rosaria if you're interested in contributing to blog, talking about a cool use case, talking about a cool technical solution to something, some piece about where data science is going in the next couple of years. Let us know. We have categories for all various types of articles on the blog. Um, also nice just to see how meetup groups, those are registered meetup groups, obviously we have users all over the place, but those are the meetup groups that we see where we support organizers launching local rule nine groups with regular meetings. So Taka, you need to do something about Japan. We have something in Tokyo as well. Next time I want to see a little dot there. Um, and then, of course, there's the Community Summit. Some of you may have noticed one star, or two of you may have noticed two stars on their badges. Those are the people that two star ones are the ones that attended already 10 or more. We're giving up after 10, we don't count anymore. Um, 10 or more of our, they used to be user group meetings, and now they are summits. Jean Christophe from Schrödinger and Stefan Weingartner from AI Associates are those, those two. We have two that are almost there, Klaus-Peter Huber and Eugene. I saw you back there. I haven't seen Klaus-Peter yet. There's Eugene. Klaus-Peter is probably still arriving. He actually told me he's coming just to make sure he gets to the number 10. And then we have two that are almost, almost there. Dean, uh, four, actually, Dean, Gerrit, Thomas, and Stefan. And then special mention, since I already bugged you, Taka, I'll mention you again. Taka keeps coming back, and he's... By far, we used to have the furthest travel, but now we have actually a couple of people coming from Australia as well, but still, Taka has been a regular for the last 10 years, so he deserves a special mention. And he comes besides having a really, really cute kid at home, which I find impressive. I'm not going to say my disclaimer, Greg, don't worry. Good, and then, of course, analyst recognition is always nice. This is now the sixth year in a row. We're starting to get used to that, which is probably dangerous. But anyway, we are up there in the leader squadron with Gardner. Um, there's lots of stuff to read about it, but I think the, the part about well-balanced execution and vision is something, considering with what kind of other companies are up there, there's the, the small little, no, that's the wrong button, the small little SAS here that some people may have heard about, and Tipco, they are up there with us as well. That's nice to see. This one is something where we always get the feedback from, from Gartner where they say the reference calls that we had with nine users were just gigantic, super positive. They really have to dig extremely deep to find something that they can complain about. So that's something they always mention to us afterwards when we talk to Gartner again. They say this is the reference calls with your customers, with your users are just totally different from all other reference calls that with others. So this positioning it's not really us, this is thanks to everybody here. I know we had about half of the references. We had, we had to submit 40, 50 references. They're actually in the room here. Thank you very much for taking the time. We know it takes a lot of time, but it's absolute. I'm not sure it's worth it, but it's cool afterwards anyway. Good. So those were some of the highlights, many more highlights. We'll have demo stations out there where we're going to talk about, um, where, we can, where you can see some of our, our software in action and talk to us and find out more about the, the other things underneath those that have been happening. But I also wanted to talk a little bit about trends that, that we're seeing in the, in the data science space. Um, and I thought before doing that, maybe it's worth briefly discussing some of the trends that we discussed in past years. Um, the thing that, and usually the trends, we start those, discussing those in the famous Phil shows on Wednesday evening, one of those also tonight. And in 2017, the Phil show, and I think that was a Star Wars-themed Phil show, if I'm not totally mistaken, was about model management, the nine model factory in Berlin in 2017, two years ago. All of this model management has since then taken off quite a bit. Um, and then in 2018, Greg talked about actually using what we presented as more of a concept, in action on a, um, on a molecular activity prediction data set where he had very trained thousands of models in parallel. Last year, we had kind of two trends that showed up, which I thought were interesting. The automation push that you can automate the hell out of data science. I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. And also privacy. To me, automation is something that we've been doing for a long time anyway. This entire idea of guided analytics, in a sense, is about automating some parts of the data science process, right? Now, again, I'll mention, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that's, in a way, has been ongoing since 2015. There's tons of talks about that also at this summit. And then Phil had the, that was the Darth Vader show. 
Um, the GDPR, where talk, was talking about using nine workflows to document and be extremely transparent about what you do with that data, which is really very much what privacy or controllable data science, in a sense, is all about. It's less about restricting access to certain data sources, because that, if you do that well, you can't do any work anymore, but it's much more about documenting and being extremely transparent about what you do so that you quickly realize that you're violating privacy constraints somewhere. Tons of sessions around that at the summit as well. And what I think is currently really what we see popping up more is people talking about pre-built data science APIs and automation to a sense is all still part of that mix, right? Being able to, again, it's the old discussion, can we somehow take the data scientist out of the mix and just pre-package it all or automate it the hell out of it? And I thought it's worth talking about that a little bit more. In order to do that, I think it's worth briefly recapping these data science personas that we used to talk about in, I think, three years ago, I talked a little bit more about the guided analytics. Why do you need sort of different layers on top of this data science in order to deploy that to real applications? So in my mind, that's still very much true. And Greg is some, sitting somewhere here, and you will miss the data engineer. I'm talking about data science personas here, right? So the data engineer, and of course, is also a big aspect of what nine workflows help, what the persona that nine workflows help, but not part of the stack. So, the first thing that you have is, of course, the people that invent new algorithms, new methods. And that's something that in data science, in my mind, makes it rather different from a couple of other technology fields. Because you, we simply, I don't know what kind of technology is going to be out there in two years that people will use or try to use to analyze or get even more insights into the data. So that's constantly growing. We need some way of making sure we have access to that and can reach out to that one, to new developments. And even if it's just to make sure it doesn't really work better either, which is actually surprisingly often the case. So that's something where we have nine community extensions, right? Some of those community extensions are contributing those new developments to the nine platform, to the nine analytics platform, and sometimes we are reaching out proactively and integrating that ourselves, some of these open source extensions. Um, the second is sort of the classic data science coder, right? It sits in the, he or she sits in the corner of the organization, writes amazing scripts that do amazing things and nobody has a clue what's going on underneath this, this code, right? Bleeding edge analytics, they can reach out to all sorts of strange new libraries and combine them in very, very sophisticated ways. That's something that in our mind is something you shouldn't forbid in an organization. You want that kind of development. You want people to try out new stuff, but you need to make sure it becomes part of your normal system. So that's why we have R, Python, deep learning, and other integrations. Then the classic data scientist, and if you, you now all know this by now, this is much more about blending all of that stuff, getting the data in shape so that you can actually run an analysis. And that, surprisingly, to me, is still a huge problem, right? And that's something automating that piece Prepackaging that piece is a totally unsolved problem and is often ignored in those discussions. That's, of course, in a sense, the nine workflow for collaboration, right? Being able to do that, document one, why you do that as a workflow, and then be able to give that to colleagues so they can use that as a starting point or just collaborate with you on those, those workflows. Then we have the casual users. I think Gardner called them three years ago, citizen data scientists or something. They just want, they, they probably won't be able to create an analytical workflow from scratch, but they can use that as a template and get started from something like that. So they want to reuse analytical blueprints for us. That's sort of where the NIME server comes in play, that you can use to share these templates with others. You can share best practices, or maybe you can just share a meta node, a little piece of a workflow that solves a particular problem, blends some data creates an interesting visualization that sort of everybody should be using throughout the organization. And then, of course, the classic business user who doesn't need to understand the data science but just wants to use it. And they're supposed to be using these analytical applications within some other tools or just the service itself, right? And there's Klaus Peter. Welcome. <laughs> I just talked about you three minutes ago. <laughs> um, so these analytic applications and servers, that's of course where the NIME server comes in, in play where you say, I can now deploy this workflow as a container, I can deploy this workflow as a REST service, or I can deploy this workflow to someone as an analytical application in a, in a browser-based analytical application. Good. So looking at that, 
you can now say this making everybody a data scientist, this push in the in 2015, a couple of years ago, where I essentially said, you know, we don't need these people. It's going to be the casual users. We're going to empower them to be data scientists. And I remember back, I think we talked about that three years ago. I said, well, this is almost like you hand them this book, the data science for dummies. And then I wanted to mock up the title and I actually had to find out that book does exist. <laughs> so there's, but I still think, I mean, by now everybody has accepted the fact that data science in the end, there's a reason why there's a science in the title, right? There's something you need to know what kind of technologies you're using in order to get some insights out of the data without total nonsense, right? Do you remember this stupid little event particip... No, sorry, Iris. This sophisticated, great event participation the thingy that the forecasting system that I showed you before. If you don't really know what you're doing and you don't include all of the data, you trust the system and will just predict nonsense, right? And there's increasingly many articles out there where they also say this, this flood of machine learning and AI throughout organizations often results in decisions being made that are based on nothing, just random data, right? So that's extremely risky. So I think that's something that that's a trend that has officially died. Um, and then there's this other push that started maybe a year and a half ago about automating data science. Again, the idea is we can get rid of that. You don't need that. You have business users that have problem. We're going to automate the hell out of that. And that is, that may work to a certain extent. You're automating all of the model selection, which model to use. I don't know. I don't want to know what a gradient to boost the tree is. I don't need to know what the difference to deep learning or other models is. And I don't want to know which of the many parameters and how to optimize them. So maybe we can automate that. We can automate that to a certain extent. But we, of course, need to hope that whoever sold us this automation system keeps up with the latest, greatest technology out there. So if suddenly deep learning is not the latest type anymore, but we're now starting to about talk about three-dimensional color decision trees. I have no idea what the new next trend is going to be. You want to, you hope that that's also part of the mix so that the system tries that as well. Maybe it gives you the, the cutting edge performance. And then of course, the big thing is always in automation. You hope that your data is already in shape to be analyzed, to be run through that automation system. And that's still by far the biggest hurdle because in many cases that aren't standard type setups, the data is not yet in shape to be really analyzed. And for some odd reason, we've been talking about that for 10 years, and it's still one of the biggest hurdles ever. So that's automating science. The other part is that we are now increasingly seeing, especially the larger cloud vendors, they're offering all sorts of toolkits where you can buy, some call it cognitive services, others as AI services, whatever. You, you can purchase sort of one score per cent or something, predictions, forecasts, object classifications, right? Data science APIs, in a sense, they give you pre-configured trained models. You don't need to think about that anymore. This thing, the service does image classification. The service does speech classification, right? Works extremely well. You, of course, have to hope that the image format that this API requires is supported or is something that you actually have in-house. So there's also a bit of a data problem. You need to make sure that you can actually call that API, which in many cases, if it's not a standard problem, I just want to classify some images, is actually non-trivial to do. So you have to hope that the API matches your data. And you hope that the model does what you actually need. And that's something Dean last year gave a really interesting talk about optimizing, making sure you're optimizing for the right goal. And that's surprising how often that goes just a little bit wrong, right? Where you're optimizing for something and the goal isn't actually what you're looking for, right? We're not, we weren't so interested in how many people register the week before the summit. We wanted to know how many people are actually sitting in the room. Stupid example, but if you look at some other optimization criteria when it comes to customer churn, you're usually not interested in predicting who will churn, right? That's not the prediction you're looking for. You're looking for who is going to churn if I don't send them a letter or if I don't reach out to them, because that's something that I can actually optimize. Some people will churn no matter what, right? There's no reason trying to go after them. <clears throat> And then, of course, for a lot of these data science APIs, you have kind of two conflicting wishes. You want to make sure they are always updated to the latest, greatest technology. But if you're really using this in production, I'm pretty sure you're also reasonably interested in making sure somehow these results are reasonably stable or reproducible. You don't want to be that all over the place. Suddenly, your customer gets classified as the worst customer ever just because the technology underneath the hood changed, right? So some sense of reproducibility is probably extreme is in many production applications very important for those data science APIs. Good. So automation versus APIs, I think we agree that data science for everybody is kind of dead. We don't need to, that's, I think, 
not many people argue about that anymore. The data science APIs to me are something, it does make sense, right? I really, if I'm interested in classifying images, I am not going to collect thousands of images to be able to run my own tr training thingy and I'm going to figure out which deep learning architecture to use to build a good image classification service. That's something I'm just going to purchase as a service. I'm going to call that. Google does a great job at that. Amazon does a great job at that. Amazon has way more pictures with labels that I'll ever be able to collect, right? Speech recognition. So for some of those things works extremely well. So if you are interested in predicting event participation the week before your event, based purely on the past attendee numbers, talk to Iris, she's going to sell you that service. What you shouldn't count on is continuous backwards compatible upgrades that you know I'm really going to get bleeding edge performance. Nobody can do a better job at predicting event participation than Iris service. Although I do trust Iris that she's going to continuously <coughs> update that one. But that's just in this particular case. Data science automation on the other hand is something where you say, okay, it's Still a fairly well-defined problem. I have the data all in shape to run, but I don't really find the pre-packaged solution. So in my mind, this is something, if you're really interested in predicting developer beer consumption based on release stress, that's probably a different nuance for almost every organization. So you're not going to find the pre-packaged API, the service at Amazon or Google or somewhere else, but you need to automate that. But it's pretty clear what you need to feed in what you and then the, the automation, which model pick which parameter to optimize and what the output is. So that probably does work. In this particular case, we are probably not that interested in cutting edge performance because at least at nine, beer consumption is not yet a regular gigantic budget item, right? So it's not going to kill us if you're 2% off on beer consumption. But if the prediction is actually core part of your business, you may not want to trust automation because you're never ever going to get really that last percent out of it anyway. So the answer to everything, shrink wrapping pre-built data science, probably not, but it's a good answer if you want trying to solve a standard problem with standard methods for standard data, right? As long as you don't have to do a lot of data shuffling and you're okay with an okay solution, that's really the way to go. But if that was the case, you probably wouldn't be here. So why then custom data science? I mean, it's essentially it's just flipping this around. You have real data, right? You really have a setup where actually putting the data in shape that you can start working with it is still a massive part of your problem, right? This data engineering type thing. You have new fields, new sources are popping up. Every other month, somebody else says, hey, we could probably improve the performance here if we also incorporated the Twitter analysis or use this other data set that we now have new data types, and just in general, you have messy data, and that unfortunately is still reality. Um, you have in-house domain expertise, so you don't want to just give that to someone else to automate the hell out of it, but you actually have people who understand the business problem very well. You want to incorporate their knowledge as well. And you may have data science expertise in-house, or maybe you're working with one of our great nine partners that do bring in the data science expertise. Combining those two together is going to give you bleeding edge performance. And in many cases, you may also just have a hybrid setup, right? It's not every data is now in the cloud or every data is in your data lake or something. There's a bit of legacy data floating around. You have some data or computation done, sitting or done on premise in some cluster on one cloud or maybe even two clouds. You just want to combine that and not wait for this mythical data warehouse to finally show up where all of your data is accessible, nice and clean. And what you need, you want above average performance. You want to be able to have that collaboration. You don't want to just create something that's one data science application. Everybody keeps using that and you never ever refine that and you never ever learn from that either. And then of course, reliable reproducible results is surprisingly often still very much ignored. But in production, you want to be sure that what you do yesterday is kind of at least related to what you're doing tomorrow. Backwards compatibility goes into that one as well. For me, that's extremely important. A lot of these coding environments, if you try using that a year or two years later, some packages changes, something changes. You can't even run the original program anymore. And then you really want to adjust that to solve a similar problem based on that as a blueprint. It's almost impossible. So the real issue in my mind is not so much about do we automate or do we use custom APIs, but how do we make custom data science faster? How can we get faster to a solution that we actually can put into production? Um, 
to me, we are still arguing back and forth with the Python and the R communities. For me, this is not an either or, right? This is not about forcing everybody to program. You shouldn't force all of your data scientists to program. But on the other hand, you shouldn't lock out the data science, the scientists in your organization that do the programming either. So you need to integrate the code. To me, it's kind of, you talk to hardcore Linux people now, you would have talked to them 10 years ago, they would have said, Linux doesn't need a UI. What a nonsense, nobody needs push around mouse. Now even our hardcore Unix people, Linux people at, the, at NIME, they are using a mouse and they're using a UI. So Linux never needed a UI either, but it does make, the interesting part here, it does make your life a lot easier to do the standard stuff, right? But of course, all of these Linux geeks at NIME, at some point in time, they will open a console and they will start writing code, right? You need to combine the two, the best of brief. Um, you want room to play, so you shouldn't just say this is the types of analytical routines that we're offering you. You can reach out to some cool new development. You want to know how these three-dimensional decision trees thingies work. Try it out. See if that gives you a cutting edge over current performance. And if it does, then we can think about how we can integrate that into the production environment. And then, of course, this, again, I'm hammering this more, one more time today, easy access to all of the data, not being locked into something that says, hey, you can only run in this cloud, or you can only run with this type of data, or if you are wanting to merge this, or if you have a hybrid cloud set up, sorry, doesn't work with our infrastructure. You want to combine and pull all of the data get together the way you want. So in a sense, data wrangling for everybody. And ideally, you're not going to call out to your IT department to say, hey, I need this view on the data. And the, on the other end, on the phone, it says, oh, give me two days, maybe, right? You want to do that now. And one thing that's often still ignored, especially in the early part of the projects, you want to operationalize, you want to put this stuff into production, what you did, right? That's the main purpose of running data science in the end. And you, in a good way, you don't need to be able to then say, okay, I trained this model, it works well in my little test environment, we validated on test data, works great, and then you suddenly have to recode it. You hand it over to another department and they write code based on the stuff, but you can actually use the same environment to productionize what your data scientists did together with the business analysts. Not surprisingly, this is really where we still see NIME fit in extremely well, right? All of this collaboration, all of this integration is a NIME workflow. And then down there, the NIME software stack, the way we're positioning this now, Thomas is going to talk about that a little bit more. We have the analytics platform, the open source analytics platform, together with all of those integrations that are reaching out to other cool open source projects, our own extensions, community extensions, partner extensions, that allows you to create data science, right? And then the NIME server, that's the piece that allows you to productionize that one. And hopefully by the end of tomorrow evening, we were able to shed a lot more lights and talk about lots more examples of how that actually looks like, what that looks like in practice. So now some people are going to say, wait, are you telling me no automation, no APIs at all? That's not what I'm saying, not at all. So I think automation does help to optimize selection of models. If you don't really want to optimize and do this all yourself, it does save you a lot of time. Data science APIs do help you to reuse the proven. I, we are not going to, everybody here in the room should not build an image classification, a speech classification system, Twitter analysis stuff. There are services out there, incorporate them, use them as part of your analytical routine, right? And the power is really in the mix, be able to do that, but at the same time, complement it with some of the in-house expertise, some of the specialities that you have in-house, right? So custom data science automates the boring, incorporates standards and allows interaction to focus on the interesting. And we will be talking a lot more about that later today. In the deployment session, Christian is going to talk a lot more about automation, and then also the evening show with Phil is going to highlight a couple of really neat surprises on that front. So much for that. So now everybody's thinking, is he not going to talk about the A word? Really, nothing ever? Good, I'll say it, artificial intelligence. And then the funny thing is, you say, okay, I thought about the elephant in the room when I prepared this talk, and then I, I don't even know why I Googled, and I Googled, and it turns out there's a paper. It's a paper in the artificial, uh, artificial intelligence community, and it talks about the elephant in the room. So I said, that's weird. So I started reading it, and it's an image classification thingy. They're using deep learning to classify images, objects and images. So you have an image like this one, and then the deep learning thingy, it's provided as a service. Finds, the, finds a book, finds the person here, it even finds the cup here, finds the handbag here. 
And then they started playing with this image and they added an elephant. <laughs> and it turns out the neural network doesn't find the elephant. <laughs> that, of course, that's, I mean, the, if you know a little bit more about the technology, it's no surprise at all, right? It was never trained to recognize elephants or animals. In that case, it was probably trained on pictures of apartments. There are usually not that many elephants in apartments. And the funny, to me, in a way, if you think about how learning really works, I mean, there are a couple of really nice books about that. Why do humans, and when in particular do humans learn? Humans learn when they're surprised. That's the biggest part of learning. You look at something and you say, what the hell is that? And that's when you start learning, right? A deep neural network is never going to do that. I mean, we'll see. We'll see this goes. Okay, so I thought maybe it's worth briefly talking about where we put artificial intelligence in there. Because if you think about it, anyway, I'll say that in a second. So t to me, machine learning is really the field that does all of that stuff, and artificial intelligence is a part of that. Machine learning is all methods that are out there that somehow try to train some sort of a model to fit to some sort of a data, make some sort of a prediction, they cluster, they do something, right? And the term artificial intelligence is very often used when we're doing that for a task that somehow feels human, right? We're not talking, when we're talking about predicting the position of a valve so that some machine doesn't explode, we're not, never going to call that artificial intelligence. The method underneath the hood is almost the same Maybe different algorithm, maybe different model, but the idea behind underneath the hood is the same as when we are trying to find objects in an image or when we are trying to classify speech, right? The methods are fundamentally the same. So once we are doing, once we are doing this training of a model to perform human-like tasks, then we tend to call it artificial intelligence. And I think that's extremely risky because it also, in, in other people's minds that don't know the technology as well as the people here in this room, they instantly say, oh, wow, artificial intelligence, so we're talking about some sort of a human that like thingy that we can have a conversation with. Try to have a conversation with Alexa or Siri. It gets boring, very, it's kind of funny, but it's not a real conversation. Um, so Mike Gualtari from Forrester had this very nice dis distinction between what he called pragmatic AI and pure AI, or some other people also call it cognitive AI. We are still far, far away from actually doing anything that's related to real AI and intelligence that we can have a conversation with, right? What we can do is we can speed up human-like tasks, very isolated human-like tasks. We can speed those up tremendously and even get better as, as humans, right? We can recognize some of these deep learning methods can recognize objects and images better than humans, right? For extremely well-defined tasks. And then, of course, data science, advanced analytics, for me, is about the system, the entire thing that you set up, including all of the boring data preparation to actually create some sort of insights, actionable knowledge or models from data, right? So in a sense, the first part is really machine learning is about the meth it's about methods. Machine learning is AI, right? But AI is machine learning for human-like tasks, and then the data science is really more about the insights and the systems. Or, put more graphically, if you want to look at it slightly differently, if you look at the entire analytics workflow in a very abstract, nimish way, right, we have all of these data sources, we need to somehow throw them together, we need to do some cleaning, some transformation, we run some analysis, and then we want to either explore the results or we want to deploy the results, right? That's what everybody here does in one way or the other. Machine learning really only addresses this one little box here, the analysis part. That's where we have, after we had all of the data, after we put all of that together, we run our model, we try to create a prediction, we are trying to cluster, we are trying to find anomalies or other stuff, right? It's really, in the end, machine learning is only a tiny piece of that one. <clears throat> a lot of the deep learning approaches, all they do in addition to that one, they kind of push some of that learning into the feature engineering phase. So trying to figure out what kind of representation to use for your objects, that's something that deep learning does. In a, in a very crude nutshell, deep learning, the first couple of layers do feature engineering, and then the rest couple of layers do the model training. Right? It's an oversimplification, but that's really what it boils down to. And data science really is still very much about <clears throat> building this entire system that allows you to actually, including all of this boring stuff, getting all of the data in shape that actually does allow you to build models that you can then put into production. Good. So this is a, we have, every time we have a release, we try to come up with nice graphics. This is something that Cassiana created for our Christmas release. What AI does in its free time, it builds workflows, of course. Um, 
I think we're still extremely far away from this one. What we can do is we can put, if this is the part that does that, that is the analysis, we can probably use AI or better machine learning to do some of those, to automate some of these pieces, help us a little bit with that one, make us a little bit more efficient there. But automating this entire process, still, still far from, from that. Good. That's kind of my, my little comments. I'm super happy to have discussions about that over the next couple of days. So if you have your own opinion on that one, I'm glad to. How did Lotfi Zadi always say, feel free to disagree? Um, that's how we learn. Um, but let me spend a few minutes talking about the Spring Summit. Um, as I already mentioned, we made some changes. Part of that is due, it started off as a user group meeting. It was really nine users meeting. And I remember we changed the name when we got increasingly many emails from people before the user group meeting. They said, well, I'm really interested in using Nine, but I'm not yet using it. Can I still come? And we said, sure, we have training courses and everything. That's sort of when we, I think five or six years ago, we said, let's rename this thing and make it a bit more, make it a bit clearer. This is for a broader audience, and that's why we call that a summit now. So we have an increasingly diverse audience. There are people coming here that really want to learn the latest, greatest little geek tricks to use the analytics platform to use Nine workflows. But we also have people that want to see how do you actually productionize data science? How do you put that in production in a real organization? So one of the things we did is we now have today, we have a parallel track where one is more for data science for the business, a bit more of this high level view on how do you actually make data science produce business value in a sense. And on the other side, we have a track that talks a little bit more of the, about um, data science for the data science. It's a little bit more the geeky session in my mind. And then tomorrow morning, we used to always have a parallel life science track. So we now carve this out three different areas. So we have a life science track, an IoT slash automation track, and one on customer intelligence. Um, the other problem that we had, and I remember that last fall in Austin, we had a three hour session shared by Bernd on what's new in NIME. So the people started running away after two hours, right? They had to pee literally, or they just wanted to grab a coffee, or they were just getting tired of Bernd. So we figured we need to do something about that. We're doing something about that by splitting it up a little bit and try to um, combine the what's new session, so what's new in NIME software, with a couple of user or customer talks that actually do something that's related to that. So later today, we have this what's new for deployment session, where Kristen is mostly going with, with the team is going to cover some of the new developments around deploying data science. We are going then, then tomorrow morning, we have the what's new in Nine Analytics platform. Bernd will be on stage, don't be worried, but not for three hours, um, where we talk about the what's new in the analytics platform, followed by a couple of talks that are more focusing on use of the analytics platform. And then in the afternoon, we have a what's new in Nine server session chaired by, by Jim. Um, and then the, the th biggest change is people were complaining that the Phil show in a conference center is just boring. So what we did is we moved him to a theater. We are going to have the Phil show in the evening at the cinema close by. There's going to be a walking tour. Thomas is going to talk a little bit about logistics later. That should be a more appropriate venue for Phil and his team talking about really cool new stuff. As usual, let us know, oh, this is the, uh, let us know if this works, right? If you have ideas, I mean, I remember Frank last, I think that was not the first time that he mentioned that, but he said it would be really nice if for the experienced NIME users, we've been using NIME for years, you did a little bit of a training course where you just talk about the new stuff. So we added refresher courses this year, let us know if that worked and if these program changes didn't work, did work, or you had some other ideas how to change that, please let us know. Um, one other thing, we are now too many people. I, last year, I walked out of the summit, and I think I still, on Friday afternoon, I saw people with a nine badge around their neck, and I thought, who the hell is that? Right? It's hard to meet 409 people. We won't even try. But we are going to have a nine champion table out there. Come to us during the coffee breaks, tomorrow during the poster session, and just tell us stories about what you're doing. We are curious. We want to learn what you do with NIME. We want to learn what kind of problems you encounter. We want to learn what other things you'd like to see in NIME. Just come to us, talk to us. <clears throat> There's going to be a tiny little survey. You don't need to fill that in if you don't want to, or you don't, people will actually help you fill that in. Um, if you are interested in writing a blog with us, recording a video, doing some propaganda with us, great, even better, but that's absolutely not a requirement. We are mostly just interested in finding out what you do, what works, what doesn't work. So talk to us at the champion table. Iris and Phil are mostly going to be there, a couple of other people as well. I think it's just straight out here, straight out of the draw. 
Um, and then one very special focus during that session is scalability. We are very interested in your take on scalability. Um, Phil is working on some stuff as well. He's going to talk about that tomorrow in the afternoon. But if you have an interesting story and you don't mind sharing it, we're going to have a little impromptu panel talking about that as well. So if that's something you fancy doing, totally up to it. That's all I wanted to say. Um, just set a little bit of uh, the tone for the summit. I hope you're all going to have a great time and I'll hand over to Thomas who is going to cover some of the not so technical things but that are probably also interesting and also a little bit about the log logistic together with Rosaya, Paul and Christian. Thank you very much and enjoy Berlin. <laughs>